welcome to St. James. I'm Ashley and this is Tumi. And wherever you're watching from, we hope you enjoyed today's sermon. Our church's commitment is your transformation through the life-changing message from the Bible about Christ. With our theme this year being growing deeper in Him and each other, we pray that this launch series helps you do exactly that in 2024. And if you ever find yourself here in Cape Town seeking guidance or have any questions, please feel free to come join us here at St. James Kenilworth. All of our contact details are linked below, but for now, enjoy the sermon. Now, I've got Jane McPherson uh, here with me at the front this morning. Jane's normally at the 8 a.m., but uh, she's hung around this morning to join us at the 10. We've got a mission slot, and often when we think about missions, we think about overseas, which makes a lot of sense. But also, we need to realise that mission partnerships happen a lot closer to home. And so this morning, our mission slot is for one of our uh, gospel partnerships that happens right here at St. James once a month with a ministry called Challenges. Uh, Jane has been involved in overseeing Challenges for many years, so she's going to tell us a bit about it this morning. Uh, Jane, just sketch out for us, who is Challenges for... And tell us about uh, what a typical meeting looks like for you guys. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for letting me do this slot. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Estelle. <laughs> <laughs> so, Challenges is mainly a mission to mentally and physically challenged adults. They come from various places in the Western Cape, from all different backgrounds. They come from group homes, and they come from private homes. <clears throat> But it's also a ministry to some helpers and some family members and carers who come along who haven't heard the gospel. So a typical meeting for us is celebrating birthdays, singing their favorite choruses, and they sing their hearts out, don't you, Estelle? <laughs> you absolutely do. We have a Bible story or a gospel talk and a craft and we have lots of games. We do table games like bingo and snakes and ladders and um, musical games. They love musical games, especially with lots of dancing and refreshments. But can I just say on that note, thank you to all the ladies who provided wonderful eats for their Christmas party. That was so wonderful. Now, uh, Jane, you meet in the mills in the hall behind us. Um, give us a feel for numbers. How many people normally come through for a challenges? Yes, we meet once a month. It's approximately the second Saturday of the month. And we have about 120 challenges and about 20 helpers. Yeah. I I've popped in from time to time to do uh, one of the talks. Uh, it is, these guys know how to party. Uh, let me just say, <laughs> I think on one of my visits, uh, it was a special occasion. There was KFC. Um, you would have thought Jesus had returned. It was fantastic. Uh, now, Jane, tell us, we're obviously focusing uh, this year particularly on growing deeper. Um, help us to understand how does challenges um, help folk to grow deeper in the Lord Jesus? Okay, so we help them to come to Jesus and to grow deeper by using a Bible story or a gospel talk we always use pictures and props and sometimes songs and interactive talks. And we try to make it simple and straightforward, easy to understand. And then we have a craft to follow that, which reminds them of the lesson and applies it to their lives. And we show them the love of Jesus. Very important. Now, Mervyn's going to be preaching for us a little later on um speaking from Colossians chapter 1 about how the gospel bears fruit, not just in our lives, but in all the world. Um, at the 8 a.m., you shared a few stories about how the gospel is bearing fruit in the lives of some of those who attend challenges. Just tell us some of those stories again this morning. They were so wonderful to hear. Yeah. So we ask them lots of questions throughout the afternoon, and their answers show us that Many of them really understand the gospel and they have come to the Lord and become his children. Several of them ask for Bibles and we've been able to give them Bibles. And one young man 
came to me and said, I want my own Bible because I want to read it myself. But I know that he can't read. And so I contacted his mom, and she bought him a beautiful picture Bible. And now he can read it for himself from the pictures. Isn't that wonderful? And then lastly, I just want to share with you. One day, a mom brought her daughter to Challenges, and she stayed as a helper. And sometime later, she said to me, you know, I am a backslidden Christian. I had stopped going to coffee morning and to church. But being here at Challenges and hearing these simple talks about Jesus and hearing about Jesus in the songs and seeing the love of Jesus here, I have come back. And she's walking with the Lord again. So it's a precious ministry to mentally and physically challenged and even to helpers and others. Challenges is a wonderful opportunity for both evangelism and helping believers to grow as fully committed disciples of Jesus. And we're very privileged and proud to be part of it here at St. James. If you want to find out more from Jane, uh, you'll be at the expo afterwards. She'll be at the expo in the hall behind us at a table for challenges. If you'd like to know how you can give or serve or just visit to check it out with maybe a view to being a helper, why don't you come speak to her? She'd love to have a chat and um, they'd love to be able to have us share in their ministry as much as we can. Why don't you thank Jane? Thanks so much for sharing with us this morning. Hi St. James, my name is Bass and I'm the camera guy here at St. James and we're currently filming the big news here in Takai Forest. For those that don't know, the big news is a video that gets released at the beginning of each month to kind of keep you up to date on all the events happening at St. James on that month. If you want to check it out, you're more than welcome to check it out on all our social media platforms. But until then, grow deeper, stay rooted and God bless. So keep an eye out this week for the big news where we make that video uh, with all the events, times, places, people you need to contact. Uh, it saves some of the clutter out of our service. Uh, if you get contacted by us this week asking to migrate to a different WhatsApp group, you are not getting spammed. Okay, whenever anyone wants me to do anything on a group, I get a bit anxious, but we are cleaning up our WhatsApp groups. We're making them a bit more streamlined for better communication. So if you get a prompt this week to join a group or to do something with your number on one of our existing groups, that's okay. That's meant to happen. You're in good hands. And then lastly, from Jenny uh, and Lates with Kids and Youth, we run a thing called Pod Club. Um, where we put out really helpful parenting resources, uh, a podcast to listen to. So you've got to listen to it first. And then on Friday this coming week, uh, the parents meet together to discuss it um, around the issues that were raised. This week's a special one. We're kicking off with a dads only, just the boys. All right. Uh, so we're going to swap it the following time. We're going to have just the mums. But this one is for just the dads. So dads, uh, you would have gotten the link. If you didn't, then come see me. We'll get you connected and uh, get ready for the first dads edition of Pod Club this Friday up here at church. Well, it's, it's sad happy news. I'll, I'll frame it that way. So the sad news is that Roger Herman, a.k.a. James Bond, <laughs> standing over here, a.k.a. the Cape Town Ballroom Dancing Champion of 1921. <laughs> um, actually, Roger, I'm, I'm joking about ballroom, but just tell us a little bit about your, your hidden life here with ballroom dancing. Just, just want to hear more about that from him. I'll just stand over here so you can't reach me. <laughs> All right, just short and sweet. 1975, uh, I became the South African pre-amateur ballroom dance champion. Shall we dance? Would you like to dance? Oh, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you can dance, Glenda. Um, no, in all seriousness, friends, um, th this January, now, end of the month, um, Roger reached retirement age. And so we'll be stepping off our paid staff here at St. James. And we wanted just to uh, mark that moment and to publicly thank both Roger and Glenda for their remarkable service to our church. Um, the good news is, the happy bit, 
is that Roger and Glenda are not leaving Cape Town, not setting up and going to pick up shells on the beach or something somewhere. They're actually staying in their home. They're remaining part of our church and, in fact, will remain involved in the ministry that they have been involved in, but they are no longer, Roger is no longer part of the formal staff. Glenda served, of course, for a number of years leading the St. James Educational Trust, which COVID really brought to an end in terms of access to the schools in that way. Roger has been a warden here on, as management council. He's been our business manager for a while. He now looks after our pastoral care and evangelism particularly. Whenever Roger comes back from a hospital visit, it's not uncommon to hear him say, da 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 da, -da and they turn to the Lord. Um, God has given him a wonderful gift to explain the gospel. They've got kids here, kids in other churches in the Western Cape. Guys, we just want to say a really big thank you to you both. And um, I don't know if you want to say anything, Roger, formally after all that. Thank you, Merlin. Um, yeah, it's been over 30 years since we, we joined St. James when our, kids were, our three kids were still small and we had to find a church that would cater for them. Happily, St. James did. They learned the gospel here. I think they're all serving the Lord, so we're very grateful for that. Mm. We've been serving the Lord since we got saved. I got saved in 1975 as well. Uh, Glinda's been a Christian all her life. Grew up in a Christian home at the age of five. Okay, so She was this old enough. Check, this is check your mate, right? Yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> She was old enough to understand the gospel, and so kids don't underestimate kids and their ability to mm. understand the gospel. So uh, we've been serving, as Mervyn said, in various capacities. It's been our privilege to be able to serve, um, and uh, we're not retiring because um, servants of the Lord don't retire. Uh, we just get retreaded, apparently. Um, <laughs> so as Mervyn says, we'll be around... Uh, we've been doing uh, Wednesday evening uh, home groups for the last decade and a bit. Uh, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue with Bible studies later in the year. And so, as, as he said, uh, we won't be lost to the church. This is still our home church. And so thank you all for all your support, your prayers, your encouragement, both to Glinda and I. And our hope is that we will continue to grow deeper this year as a couple uh, and as we encourage others to do the same. Thank you. We'll give you the last word, Mrs. Herman. Anything from your side? So I know, I know he doesn't look 69, but his ID book says differently. <laughs> That's a question that came up at the 8 o'clock service. And there was a second question. They wanted to know if we have the inevitable job jar. So for those of you who are under 40, the job jar is the baby boomer, boomer's version of a to-do list. And yes, we have one. It's 40 years old. We've been nurturing it. We've been stuffing it. We've been feeding it. And the expectation is that it would shrink. Um, please note, I said expectation. I'll tell you in due course whether it was unrealistic. But just to say thank you for welcoming us into St. James and for allowing us to serve you. Um, thank you to all of those who uh, have become family, become friends, and... I think the best way to get to know your church family is to serve. And so um, that has been our experience. We've met many, many, many of you over the years, and we just want to thank you for your friendship and for encouraging us as we serve the Lord. And so as Roger and Mervyn said, we'll remain partners. And so hopefully we'll be bumping into you again over the course of the weeks ahead. But just thank you so much. It's been a great privilege to be part of the team. No, no, you don't get the last word. Let's say thank you to them, will you? <laughs> There's a chance to greet one another and to give to gospel work here at St. James while the collection's being taken. Please do that now. Well, good morning, everybody, again. <laughs> the reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Reading from the ESV, okay, from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. 
We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which came to you, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again, dear friends, and uh, welcome to St. James. It is lovely to have you with us, whether you are a regular here at church, a newcomer here at church, friends uh, back uh, visiting again after some time. It's wonderful to have you all with us. Gerald, where are you? Are you here? Over there is Reverend Gerald. He is actually from East Africa, from Uganda, and he is studying for two years, doing postgraduate work at George Whitfield College. And uh, I met him this past week. I've been doing some lectures at the college this past week. And he's taken his life into his own hands and come to visit us here at St. James. So, habari asubui, my brother. And welcome to St. James. Uh, Yes, let's say hello. (laughs) Gerald's presence will mean that's the only clerical collar you'll see. I did explain to him that we are truly Anglican. We just don't look like it. Right, time to pray and time to get to work. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace to us. And now as we get to this business of studying your word together, we pray for your help. Ask that it may do its work among us. For your name's sake. Amen. Just before we dive in, let me remind you, if you've got little people with you, become restless or slightly um, noisy, whatever, The hall behind us, there's a screen, and you can see and hear everything. I leave that to your discretion. Now, as you heard right at the beginning of our service, last Sunday, we launched not the year, that started sometime before, but we launched the St. James here with a look at the parable of the sower and a reminder from Jesus' words in that parable of the opportunity and the responsibility that each and every one of us have, no matter who we are, the opportunity and the responsibility that each and every one of us have to grow deeper in our relationship with Christ during 2024. Both an opportunity, but also a responsibility. Over the next three Sundays, we want to keep thinking about this theme of growth and growing deeper. And we want to look at a part of Colossians chapter 1, the first 20 verses or so of Paul's letter to the Colossians. And we want to think about Paul's teaching about three things in particular. The growing gospel, that's the title up on the screen today. The growing Christian, we want to focus on that next week from verse 9 through to verse 14, and then Jesus, the growth giver, that wonderful picture and description of Jesus in chapter 1, verse 15, through to verse 20 in Colossians 1. So if you want to read ahead, that's what we're doing today, 1 to 8, at least partially, 1 to 8, next week, 9 to 14, the week after 15 to 20. But today then, as the slide tells you, we want to focus our attention on What I've called the, well, not I've called, I've used Paul's language to describe as the growing gospel. And in particular, I want you to look at one verse in the reading that we had, verse 6. End of verse 5, really, in verse 6. Look at how Paul describes the gospel in those two verses. Verse 5 and verse 6. You may have the NIV in front of you, which is absolutely fine. I just use the ESV, but the NIV is perfectly good and accurate. And in fact, maybe here even has a slightly better version. So the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, 
The ESV is, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. I think the NIV has, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. So there's the idea that all over the world, the gospel is growing and bearing fruit. And that's a very encouraging thought, is it not? In a time when we think that perhaps Christianity is in the de on the decline and Christianity is not going. I mean, I know Paul's speaking about the first century. He's talking to the Colossians about this gospel has grown and borne fruit and reached them in Colossae as it is doing everywhere else. But the great news is that that hasn't stopped. That here we are, however many thousand years later, and this gospel is still bearing fruit and growing all over the world. If you have a chance to chat to Gerald after the service about the church in Uganda, and you discover the extraordinary things that are going on there, you will discover that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing in Uganda, as it is all over the world. Melissa working in Asia, Rod and Glenda working in Asia, whether it's on the Cape Flats here, people working with Muslim outreach, wherever it is, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. So that is a wonderful truth, amen? It's a great thing to know that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Our key point for today, off the back of Paul's statement that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing, is this. That if you and I are to grow deeper in Christ in 2024, that this gospel that's bearing fruit and growing everywhere has got to grow in us. What a shame it would be if the gospel's bearing fruit and growing everywhere and we get left out. That would be a great loss, yes? So we see and hear that this gospel is bearing fruit and growing all over the world. And my deep concern and our deep concern for you and your deep concern for yourself ought to be that this bearing fruit growing gospel should grow and bear fruit in you and in me. Now, in describing the gospel as bearing fruit and growing, there is something that Paul is not saying. And I wondered, actually, about whether I should say anything about this at all. Because it's one of those things that goes without saying, right? But you all know the little statement, right? If it goes without saying, it needs to be said. Because some of these things are so ever so self-evident to us, so obvious to us, that we actually forget them. And before we know where we are, we actually get caught out. Um, when Paul talks about the gospel as growing, let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying that the gospel is like you and me, who change as we grow. So I'm hot on Roger's heels. Not nearly as suave. I don't have that James Bond look. Somebody once said to me, Mervyn, you've got a wonderful face for radio. <laughs> Go figure. So I have changed over the years as I've grown. And uh, now with little Beth in our world, I'm interested to see how she changes as she grows. Can I say to you that the gospel is not like that? When Paul says that the gospel is growing, he's not saying it's changing. When he says it's growing all over the world, Paul is not saying that depending on where you are in the world, or depending on when you live, you will get or you will need a different gospel. Now, I said at the beginning, it goes without saying, right? I mean, I hope all of us in this building actually believe that. So why am I saying it? Why have I taken time to say what Paul does not mean? And the reason, dear friends, is quite somber, actually. Because over the last few years, in my own experience, 
in my role, both as a pastor and someone involved in training pastors, and indeed someone connected to our theological college. I have come to realize that within what is known as the evangelical church, so I'm not talking about people out there who don't start out holding that the gospel is authoritative or don't believe the Bible. I'm talking about people that we would consider, at least by the label, to be part and parcel of what we stand for and who we are. I have discovered that it has become once again fashionable to tinker with the gospel, to add things to the gospel that we feel belong there or to take things out of the gospel that we feel should not be there. So, for example, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul begins his gospel with the declaration of the wrath of God. Yet, sadly, today, in circles where they would call themselves evangelical, it is becoming more and more common to find that the wrath of God is never spoken about. Are you with me? Now, it goes without saying that Paul doesn't mean that the gospel itself changes. And yet, in our world, and even among those who, sometimes, who really ought to know better, actually, as I look and as I listen, I see this happening. And it's very distressing. And it is very disturbing. And it is leading, actually certainly amongst my evangelical friends in the United Kingdom, to those who stand firm for the gospel to come under a great deal of pressure and even persecution. So pray for our evangelical brothers and sisters in the United Kingdom, will you? Because they are under real pressure, especially those in the Church of England, which seems, as far as I can work out, to have utterly lost its mind. Goodness knows what Justin Wilby thinks he's doing as the Archbishop. Anyway. That's another matter for another day. So when Paul says the gospel is growing, he's not saying the gospel is changing. How do we know he's not saying that? Is this just Mervyn on his little soapbox and his hobby horse? Is that what this is? No, listen to how Paul speaks. Verse 5. How does Paul describe this gospel? You see it? The word gospel comes at the end of verse 5. But look at the description that comes just before the gospel. Of this you have heard before in, how does Paul describe it? Not a word of truth among many words. Your truth, my truth, all our truth, together we'll go under our seat and pull out our truth, wave it around, the Oprah gospel. No, no. Sorry if you like Oprah. No, no, it is the word of the truth. You don't get more objective than that. This is not some vague, undefined thing that Paul is talking about. When Paul describes the gospel, he calls it the word of the truth. It's objective. It is bounded. It has a definite content. And we know that because... This gospel, verse 6, what does he say about it with the, with the Colossians? This word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you. Do you see that? Now, when I say come to you, you might say, well, they just heard it. But Paul doesn't quite say, he says later on you heard it and understood it. But what he's actually saying is this was a gospel that was received and which was passed on. It came to them as an objective reality, not something that they invent or cook up or change or adapt and say, well, we like these bits of the gospel, but those bits we don't like. No, no, this gospel Paul receives, and via Epaphras, it gets passed on to them. Verse 7, what do we do with the gospel? We learn it. It's got content. It's got form. It's got structure. It's got limits. So the gospel is not something that we invent, but something that we inherit. So when Paul says this gospel is growing, he really doesn't mean that it's up for grabs, dear friends. 
though we can change it and adapt it and make it suit us and fit. You know, rather like having a piece of cloth that's got gospel, and then we can all cut our own little gospel suit out of it, according to our design. No, no, this gospel is something that comes to us, that guards us, and that we are to God. Well, if Paul doesn't mean that the gospel is changing, then what does he mean when he says the gospel is growing, bear fruit and bear, uh, bearing fruit and growing? What he is saying is that the gospel, which is unchanging, produces change. Wherever this gospel goes, it changes things. Now, I can tell you that the history of East Africa, I know something of the mission of God in East Africa. I can tell you that the mission of God in East Africa, for all the faults of the missionaries, and it's funny, these days, whenever you talk about missions, everyone talks about the faults of the missionaries. And yes, they were sinners just like us, and there's a generation that will look back on us and say, what in the world were they thinking? But for all the faults of the missionaries, when this gospel went to East Africa, Chat to Gerald, he will tell you. When this gospel went to East Africa, it brought about profound change. In the days of George Whitfield and John Wesley in England in the 18th century, a slogan was in the gin houses of London, and we're talking about kids, that you could be drunk for a penny, blind drunk for twopence, tuppence. That was the world into which God's gospel went in 18th century England. It utterly transformed through God's work by His Spirit through the gospel in the great evangelical revival. So much so that by the end of that time, as we move from the 18th into the 19th century, slavery was abolished, the factories were reformed. The, the, I've just been reading a book, actually, on the impact of evangelicalism in Great Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the impact was remarkable in every area of life that you could imagine, including, let me say, freedom for women. The most astonishing impact, wherever the gospel goes, it grows. Things change. And that's great news, dear friends, would you not say? But is it growing in us? Is it doing its work in you and in me? Well, I need to move on because I'm getting distracted by myself. Sometimes the noise in my head bothers me and I just lose my way. So how will this happen? This growing gospel, how will this growing gospel bring growth in you? Well, in the light of what I've just said, the first thing is this. You've got to welcome it as it is rather than as you'd like it to be. Yeah? If this gospel is going to grow in you, you're going to have to take it as it is, not as you want it to be. By the way, that's what Paul is on about in verse 1. See how Paul describes himself in verse 1? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. That's a very interesting way of introducing yourself, right? Paul introduces himself as an apostle of Christ by the will of God because in that one verse, he is seeking to do one fundamental thing. He is seeking for the Colossian Christians whom he'd never met. They'd known Epaphras, but never Paul. He is seeking for the Colossian Christians to establish his authority. And the reason he's doing it is because there were people coming into the church in Colos Colossi who were saying, having Jesus is great, having Paul, not so much. Jesus, yes. Paul, mm, nah. Well, that was the first century. Not so very long ago, I read a statement by someone, a scholar, who said, I love Jesus, but I hate Paul. Nothing new under the sun, right? So let me say this to you, dear friends. Whether Paul unsettles you or not, whether you agree with him or not, here is the thing. I mean, obviously, we mustn't twist Paul's words. 2 Peter 3 tells us that twisting Paul's words leads us to destruction. So we mustn't make Paul's words say what they are not saying on matters of sexuality, church, government, and a whole host of other things. We mustn't make them say what they're not saying 
But here is the bottom line. We cannot grow deeper in Christ through the gospel if we are constantly fighting with Paul. Yeah? So can I encourage, dear friends, I mean, I don't know your heart, you don't really know my heart, and let's just leave it at that, because I think that's the safest place for all of us to be, right? If we all knew what was going on in each other, we'd run a mile and never come here. But can I say to you that if you find yourself at this moment in time as a Christian wrestling with Paul, fighting with Paul, having worked hard to understand him correctly, if you find yourself fighting with Paul and wrestling with Paul, Please recognize what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 36. Let anyone who is spiritual or a prophet understand this, that what I write to you is the command of the Lord. So, no matter how much Paul irritates you, frustrates you, annoys you, challenges you, can I say to you, dear friends, if you want to grow as a Christian, you can't fight with Paul. Because what Paul says, God says. It is to us in Scripture, what Paul writes, including in this letter, the very Word of God. Yep. It goes without saying, right? It needs to be said in this day and age. Don't fight Paul. He is an apostle of Christ by the will of God, and his words come to us as God's words. That's why, by the way, I don't like red-letter Bibles. Have you got a red-letter Bible? Wonderful. Don't burn it. But I don't like red-letter Bibles because they single out the words of Jesus, not always accurately, I might say, especially in John's Gospel, but they single out the words of Jesus in red as if those words have more authority than the other words. But all Scripture is God-breathed, right? And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture is written to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ, not just the bits in red. So let's not be like dear old Marcion, the ancient heretic, who threw Paul out, or rather threw the Old Testament out and loved Paul. So that's a totally useless illustration. Let's not do that. All of Scripture is from God, including what Paul says. Wrestle with him, understand him, get help in understanding him if you have to. But you'll never grow deeper as a Christian, dear friends, if you're constantly fighting with Paul. It's not going to happen. How else will we grow? Well, receiving Paul's gospel as it is, not as we want it to be. Secondly, we grow, says Paul, by grace. Don't you love that in verse 6? Just as you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. We only grow by grace. It's a gift from God. And so as we seek to grow deeper, we need to become more and more dependent on God, the Holy Spirit, to do this work in us by His grace. But notice how that grace manifests itself in these verses. I am nearly done, so don't worry. I've got to watch. Look at verse 4 and verse 5. Paul talks about these Colossian Christians as having faith in Christ Jesus Love for all the saints and the hope of heaven. Do you see it? Faith, love, and hope. In Paul's writing, and indeed in the whole New Testament, faith, love, and hope are just shorthand for real Christians. How do you know you're a real Christian? Not because you go to church, but because you have faith in the Lord Jesus, you're trusting Him, you're submitting to Him as Lord, faith in Jesus who died for you, submitting to Jesus as Lord. That's what faith in Christ Jesus means, King Jesus. You have love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, even though we're a motley crew and sometimes hard to love. There's a genuine love for you, right, for them and for others. You discover this when you travel, don't you? You go somewhere, you can hardly speak the language, you don't understand the culture, but somehow or other you bump into someone who's a fellow Christian and straight away all the walls come down. And you know you with family. Faith, love, and of course the hope of the world to come. Now why am I telling you about this? Why am I saying to you, notice how, as Paul speaks about the growing, fruit-bearing gospel, he starts by describing their authentic Christianity? The reason is very simple. You can't grow as a Christian unless you are a Christian. 
You can't grow in something that you aren't, dear friend. You can't grow deeper in Jesus if Jesus is a stranger to you. You can't grow in love for your brothers and sisters if you're not part of the Christian family. You can't grow in your hope of heaven if heaven is shut to you. So for some of us, growing deeper is going to mean joining Discovering Christianity, right? Which starts, I think, on the 20th of Feb. If you, if you, if you are not sure this morning that you are actually a Christian, then for you, the first step, never mind fighting with Paul, the first step is to actually get to know Jesus. The grace of God is what happened to the Colossians and sparked their growth. And that's what you need, grace of God in Christ, to spark your growth, dear friend. Hearing and understanding. That's straight out of the, the parable of the sower. Remember, what does Jesus say? Those who hear and do not understand, the seed is taken away. But those who hear and understand, it produces fruit. So ask God by his grace to help you to hear and understand this gospel so that it may be fruit in you. How does it happen? Through faithful ministry. Do you see that? Just as you learned it from verse 7, Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Now, I need to stop because the people running Children's Church are about to collapse, which is why we try to keep the time in this service, just for their sake and for the sake of the little people. What is the take-home from today? The take-home from today, through everything I've said, is this. That for us to grow deeper, the growing fruit-bearing gospel must grow in us. It's got to get its, whatever those are, its tendrils right down deep into our hearts and minds and lives. The gospel is a thing that works, and it's got to work in us if we are to grow deeper. So from a point of view of a pledge, what that means in the light of what you've heard today is that you will pledge for your sake, for the sake of your growth, to let the gospel grow in you, right? To read your Bible, to hear the gospel, to read books that help you. I mean, the Growing Deeper Guide is designed to facilitate and help you with that. That's your pledge. But can you see that what Paul has said this morning gives the responsibility for us to make a pledge? Can you see that? So here is my pledge to you. I said a moment ago, lightly, that I'm also getting to the back end of my formal ministry life. But thank God we have a team here at St. James, not just me. Our pledge to all of you in this building, today, in a couple of years, and beyond, our pledge to you is just as we are asking you to let this gospel grow in you, our pledge to you is that we will stay true to this gospel. Because the Colossians received it because of Epaphras, a faithful minister. So our pledge to you is that whoever comes to work on this team in years to come, whoever leads this team in years to come, that we, as much as God enables us, the management council, the staff, everybody who's involved in these decisions, will make sure that this gospel grows and bears fruit here. We will stay true to the gospel. And dear friends, we need you to help us do that. If you start hearing me talk nonsense, or more than usual, if you hear me starting to say things that are not in line with the gospel, if you hear me starting to call question on Paul or Peter or James or John or any of the apostles, if you hear me starting to sprout things that are new and novel, not fresh, but new and novel, please get rid of me as quickly as possible. And if anybody else on the staff team does it, get rid of them as quickly as possible. Right? They can get fixed somewhere else. But not here. We pledge that to you. 
Pray with me. Father, we pray that this growing, fruit-bearing gospel may indeed be alive and well, not just today, but for as long as the building that hosts this church stands. We thank you for our mission partners, for the privilege that we have of playing a part in the growth of this gospel. We think of Cameron and the team up at Red Post. We pray in this week as new students arrive that this is the gospel that they will hear and that it may bear fruit and that it will grow in them. What a privilege it is, Lord, for us to be Christians in partnership in this growing gospel. Thank you for our time now as we sing your praise. May we do it with genuine thankfulness, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.